from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. An offensive message makes its way into the inboxes of hundreds of students. Tonight, the district says it was not what they intended. Students in Howell waking up to what's been described as an offensive email this morning. It contained a homophobic Bible verse and it was sent out under an official school account. Grant Herms talked to students and also the district today. Grant, what happened here? Well, we were tipped off to this email by a student who said they normally don't get involved in this type of thing, but they thought that this email was just too far beyond the pale. The school district says a student was responsible for changing what was supposed to be a mental health survey meant for the student body. Students this morning getting this email in their inbox, reading, whoopsie, looks like someone forgot to make this uneditable, adding below an Old Testament Bible verse saying gay men should be put to death. The email from the student activities address an official district account. Students like Gotti Highland say the email was the talk of school all day long. It's very messed up and um, a lot of the people I hang around with hate it. The screenshot was sent to Local 4 by a student who asked to remain anonymous, but felt the email was homophobic. They also said it came out of the blue, the email unsigned and unprompted. In a statement, the district saying the email was meant to be a student health survey, but the survey had been sent as an editable file, allowing another student to include the Bible verse. The district saying in part, as soon as the school was notified of this, editing rights were revoked, the survey was closed, and the email was deleted from accounts. The school has identified the student responsible for editing the survey and will take actions according to the district's student code of conduct. While he says he was glad something would be done, Gotti says the email, whether intended as a joke or not, still hurts. I'm part of this community, so it affects me a bit, especially in Howell. So it's hard to, it's hard to be yourself if, there is, if it feels like the world's against you. On its homepage, the district does have a policy saying that they do not discriminate against students of any classification, including sexual orientation or gender identity. And in that code of conduct, the punishment for harassment, intimidation or bullying is suspension or expulsion. We're live tonight in Detroit. Grant Herms, Local 4. All right. Thank you, Grant. We all watched anxiously as police rushed in and out of Dearborn's Hampton Inn last week during an active shooter situation. Now we're learning more about the moments officers encountered the suspect, Richard Williams Lewis, on the third floor of that hotel. Sean Lay spoke with Dearborn Police Chief today and joins us live with more new information. Sean. New insights from the chief that this now accused gunman had checked in that very day. An employee checking out loud music here where the, he was staying up on the third floor. He was shot and killed just simply doing his job. The gunman apparently furious over just $500 he thought the Hampton Inn owed him. The chief of Dearborn first on the scene here, first to go in. His thoughts tonight are with the man whose life was taken. He was going to check on other people to see if they were okay and uh, was gunned down without any warning, so it was terrible. Dearborn Police Chief Issa Shaheen's thoughts are with the Hampton Inn employee who was going to check on a man who had checked in that day but was playing loud music on the third floor. That employee was immediately gunned down. Prosecutors have charged 37-year-old Richard Williams Lewis with murder and assault. Chief Shaheen giving new insight that Williams Lewis was roaming the hallway armed with a rifle modified into a handgun like this. Shoots 223 rounds, which are rifle rounds, Sean, and so they can go through vests and through walls, and then he had uh, modified it by putting a big drum on it that could hold 100 rounds. Shaheen had just left police headquarters when the call came out. He was first through the door at the hotel. He and his team went right to the third floor. We were lucky that we didn't just turn a corner and happen to engage him, you know, and so, you know, God was looking out for us that day. You know, we, we got to the top of the stairs and we were able to enter the third floor and we saw the suspect down at the end of the hall by his uh, room. And, uh, and then he, once he saw us, he entered his room and it became a barricaded situation. After eight hours of negotiations, William Lewis surrendered without any more loss of life. Shaheen highlighting his team, not himself. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time, Sean. And so while I'm glad I could be there to help out, um, I don't know that that happens all that often, but I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. 
Dearborn's chief, however, highlighting a massive team effort that it took for an eight, ten, tense eight hour standoff, Pamela, uh, to be ended peacefully with no more loss of life. But again, everyone's thoughts with that 55 year old employee here. He was gunned down. Back to you. They certainly are. And Sean, I understand the suspect also fired a shot near the lobby. Tell us about that. Let me walk you through this. He checked in, paid for a few days. It was $500. Loud music then. He thought he was going to get kicked out. So this whole thing was over him wanting his $500 back. He even fired another shot demanding the $500 at another employee. All right, Sean, thank you. Detroit police now investigating the circumstances that led to officers opening fire on a known gang member. Police were tracking the man wanted for a murder. This was back in February in a home invasion last week. They chased him through the streets of southwest Detroit when he led them down a dead end street. The man jumped out of his car, ran up behind a hill, and then tried to crawl under a stopped train at the railroad tracks. This was on Logan Street. Police say he was carrying a 9 millimeter gun with an extended clip and he refused to put it down. That's when Detroit police opened fire. Chief James White says they're investigating whether the suspect ever fired his weapon. I just reviewed some video and it was unable to determine if he fired and how many shots were fired from the officer. So we're looking at that right now. At last update, that man was in critical condition and going through surgery. State police and the Internal Affairs Division will be investigating the shooting. A protest was held today outside of Detroit Police Headquarters because of the deadly shooting of a man in the middle of a mental health crisis. The National Action Network is demanding Detroit Police release the names of the five officers who fired at 22-year-old Porter Burks. Police say Burks came towards them with a knife and officers fired 38 times. Detroit Police issued a statement in response to the protest saying the department respects the right to peacefully protest, calling the shooting tragic. A Detroit police officer expected to be okay after being shot while off duty overnight. Surveillance video here shows the incident. This was on the city's west side off Fielding Street near Seven Mile and Evergreen. The video shows six people firing toward a car the officer was sitting in with his girlfriend. He's recovering after being grazed on his forearm. The woman wasn't hurt. Police say they do think the officer was in the wrong place at the wrong time. They also believe he was not being targeted. The investigation continues. If only we could just bottle today and then keep it. That's exactly what I was thinking. Let's just keep it for another week. Unfortunately, Kim, though, that's not going to happen. No, and if I could have done that and figured that out years ago, <laughs> things would be a lot different. I mean, we just can't. It's just it's not going to be a good couple days for us starting Wednesday into the end of the week. As far as the weather goes, rainy, windy, you name it. So we really do need to just enjoy the next 24 hours. 63 at City Airport, 64 at Metro Airport and 67 in Ann Arbor. This evening it will be dry, very pleasant. Temperatures don't fall off as quickly as they have been the last several nights. We'll stay at around 54 by midnight. Then tomorrow we get that one more day that we would just love to bottle up so much. By 4 o'clock we'll have partly cloudy skies and 75 Four degrees. Then after eight o'clock, we do expect some rain showers behind a secondary cold front coming through and look at what that cold front does to our high temperatures. That's just a sneak peek of what's ahead. I'll have your full forecast in just a few minutes. If you would like to keep up to date on the weather and the rain that we have headed our way, the best way to do it is with the forewarn weather app. You just go to your favorite app store, type in WDIV in the weather app and then download forewarn weather today. We have brand new poll numbers out tonight in that contested 10th congressional race, which is the John James Carl Marlinga matchup. And right now, John James appears to be in the driver's seat. Mara McDonald live in Roseville tonight. And Mara, James vastly outperforming the top of the Republican ticket, which our polling has shown is underwater. Sandra, he sure is. John James at this point in this race, if it was held today, is plus eight and our pollster says he has managed to capture two tiers of voters that so far the top of the GOP ticket simply hasn't been able to tap, tap into here in Southern Macomb County. Let me show you. Here's a tale of two campaigns boiled down into two sets of numbers. First, here's the overall margin. And if you want to understand why that looks that way, 
Look at these, the John James favorable versus unfavorable numbers. Now, compare and contrast with those Marlinga numbers when asked the same question. Not only do voters in this district have a more favorable view of James, more know who he is. How in the world is that possible since Marlinga is a longtime Macomb politico? Our pollster, Richard Zuba, breaks it down. He has a problem with voters under 50 who don't know him. And if you think about it, you know, most people don't know their judges. They they might recognize the prosecutor's name. He hasn't been prosecutor for a long time. The James campaign, per the numbers, has locked up its Republican base and is running neck and neck with Marlinga in independence and has captured a very interesting demographic. The big difference I see between the two races is non-college women, women who don't have a college degree. They are a key part of the Republican coalition. And right now, we have James winning them by 14 points. Back here live, 14 points. It's a big number, but we have more numbers coming up for you tonight at 11 when it comes to this whole Southern Macomb, Michigan 10 district area. What it looks like in the governor's race, it will shock you and why it makes Macomb such an interesting place to look at when it comes to these kind of numbers. That's all coming up tonight at 11. I'll see you back here. Sandra Pam, we're live in Roseville tonight. Mara McDonald, Local 4. Yeah, and Mara, real quick before you go, quick question. You know, we've heard a lot this election cycle about motivation to vote, which hasn't always been high during the midterms. Yeah, that's right, Sandra. Usually midterm elections, it's just sort of this meh kind of attitude. Well, the new numbers that we have that we're showing tonight, uh, it's a whole lot more than meh. I'll just leave it at that. It's an interesting number to look at. Back to you. All right, we'll see you at 11. Thanks, Mara. And with the election now less than a month away, absentee ballots already being mailed out. We've launched our digital voter guide. It has everything you need to know about local races, voting locations, and all of those important deadlines. Head to the elections page. You can find it on clickondetroit.com. A new week has brought another rise in gas prices in Michigan. Triple A says prices are up 19 cents compared to last week. We're now paying an average of $4.36 per gallon. That's 50 cents more than this time last month. Experts say the deadly refinery fire near Toledo is still having an impact on gas prices in the Midwest, and the decision by OPEC to cut oil production will also factor in. We have a help me hang consumer alert for you tonight. A local Carvana auto dealership has had its license suspended. A state investigation turned up a long list of violations by the Carvana along I-96 and Novi. Those include delays in issuing titles, improperly issued registrations, employees allegedly destroying documents dealing with odometer records. Carvana calling the Secretary of State's allegations baseless and reckless, also claiming it's fixed 99% of what it calls technical paperwork violations. Still ahead, it's a battle many parents can relate with. We are going to talk about setting practical limits on screen time and also enforcing them. We know it can be really difficult. An expert offering up some solutions next.